issue, though, in involving our country. It's kind of an ironic uh, situation that it happens to be election day today, because this is something that does relate to campaigns, it relates to our leadership, and to the future of our country. And what I want to talk to you about is America's world status, and that it can only be retained if we all become global Americans. America will lose its number one status in the world by the turn of the century, a few short years away, if we do not, the majority of Americans do not expand their interests and their enterprises on a global scale. And I'll tell you why as we get into this. We give you a little bit of background on myself and where I'm coming from. Uh, like you, I came from a very small town, actually, I'm afraid, both in Iowa and in Texas. And in Texas, I think this is uh, had no real contact with the international world until I got out of school, graduated from college in Texas, went on to law school, and uh, was hired by a multinational company. Turned out they were doing a lot of international work. And I was in the law department and hired to work under the general counsel, who was an old man, George Brown, uh, from the Brown and Ruth family way back when. And from that experience, I was thrust into the world of international negotiations. We had contracts in the Middle East for building offshore marine platforms, big oil platforms in the Middle East back in the 70s, and they were sprouting those things like mushrooms. Uh, finally, in 1977, I was sent out of the country for the first time, really, in my life, uh, to do an international contract. The country was Nicaragua. It was a very interesting time because this was the time when Samosa was still in power. The Sandinistas had never been heard of yet. They were about to be. We had been uh, recruited to go down there and look at a water construction project. Uh, Managua is a very interesting town because you drive, as you're driving through the city, block after block after block is like a ghost town. They're empty. And then there's a building standing and then there's an empty block. And I said, well, you know, what's the deal here? This looks so strange. They said, well, we had an earthquake in 1972, and the buildings just collapsed. And they never really bothered to rebuild them. And part of the reason they had us there was technically, or the story went, was to start on a reconstruction project, doing a water construction project. We went out, we were taken out to a beautiful crater lake up on a extinct volcano. Water had filled it up and made a resort out of it. Dined and wine to the most extravagant way you could. But after all of the said and done, and this is again during the Samosa uh, regime, there was something about that project that didn't seem quite right. Our engineers wanted to go ahead and do it. I said, I don't know why, but it doesn't seem things, things do. The left, the project stalled. About a year or so later, Samosa fell, Sandinistas came in, the Confederates became an army after Reagan was elected and the war was on in Central America. And it was all beginning to happen over a decade ago on my first trip out of the country. Since then, uh, 1979, I was in Egypt, found myself in uh, Cairo to negotiate another project for another Fortune 500 company. Uh, one day returned to the Nile Hilton and uh, was informed I had to vacate my room. I said, hmm. you know, why? He said, because you're so lucky. The president is coming to Cairo and we need your room to offer for his staff to prepare for the peace treaty between Sadat and the Israelis. I said, well, that's great, but where am I going to stay? He said, we don't care. We just have to leave. <laughs> and at the end of today. <laughs> so as it turned out, I, I knew some people there and uh, spent the last couple of days in a private Egyptian house uh, 
really enjoyed those few days, even more than the hotel staff is there that take care of you and give you all kinds of things. And it's like living the most luxurious life, and it costs virtually nothing in that type of environment. As uh, my airplane left uh, Cairo Airport, our 747 passed Air Force One that was coming in to Egyptian airspace as we were leaving. The pilot came on radio that he had uh, sent a greeting to the pilot of Air Force One. And it was one of those situations that seemed very rare today. 1982, as a result of Nixon's great uh, opening of China, I found myself walking on the Great Wall, talking with a new Chinese friend, and was very pleased to find out her main concern was freedom, freedom of travel. She didn't have it. And a few years later, that very same girl uh, was, is now attending Duke University and in Birmingham, or Durham, North Carolina. So things do change, and even then I would sense that a new China was dawning back in that cold February day in Peking. I've been through the Great Pyramids, been past the World Court, was almost sent to Iran six months before it fell. Thank God I didn't go. <laughs> uh, got to experiment with the beaches of Rio and lay down in the sand and you just perfectly conform to your body. I kind of like this global American stuff. You know, it got to be really interesting. During the course of the last 10 years, I've been very lucky uh, and had an opportunity to travel to more than 50 different countries negotiating various types of contracts on behalf of American companies. And that is why I'm here today because I found that in each of those countries I went to, there were virtually no Americans. There were always Japanese, there were always Europeans by the score, but virtually no Americans. And that is why our country is going to be, is in serious jeopardy. And you're already beginning to see the ramifications of that with the Wall Street stock crash. You can only build a castle on sand so long before it begins to crumble. And I'll tell you a little bit why. There are two major drains on our economy. We have a budget deficit that's almost $200 billion a year. The other half of our deficit is the trade deficit, which also is almost $200 billion a year. Now, you combine those, basically what that means on the trade side is that we are spending $200 billion a year more than we're making or that we're selling abroad. So either we stop buying $200 billion a year worth of stuff, our Toyota cars, our shoes from Italy, and all these other great things we like to have, or we export another $200 billion worth of stuff to balance our books. If you don't, is you borrow $200 billion to balance your books. That's what we've been doing every year that we've had one of these, only they're getting much larger. Over the span of five years, at $200 billion a year, we will have borrowed $1 trillion. $1 trillion, that's a number that may not mean much to you, but what it does mean is showing up with a 500-point drop in the stock market because that money actually, a lot of people say, don't worry about the deficit. We just owe it to ourselves. Well, we used to owe it to ourselves, but we don't owe it to ourselves anymore because that money is really being borrowed from abroad. Most of our deficit is being covered by foreign money who come in, uh, you know, the government covers the deficit by floating bonds. Most of the buyers of those bonds are Europeans and Japanese. In fact, one of the reasons we've had a stock rally is that a lot of the stock is being bought by Japanese. Japanese average households have more than $50,000 in savings, and they've now become very investor conscious. And the stock market, you know, we think of our country as isolated from the rest of the world. 
could shock anybody, but it really isn't isolated at all because the stock exchange, if you read about it, you have the New York exchange, it rolls to the London exchange, it rolls to Tokyo, to Hong Kong. And now, it used to be what happened in New York influenced the London market, the Tokyo market. I read the other day in the, in the New York Times, now the New York market is reacting to the Tokyo market. If it goes up, it kind of, we might have a good day on New York. If it goes down, we're in real serious trouble because if foreign investors stop buying those bonds, our economy hits a mountain like an airplane because we don't have any money. So we, we have been living on borrowed time. Okay, so how do we deal with these problems? Because they're going to affect you. They're going to affect the number of jobs you have. They're going to affect your income. They're going to affect your children. But to start off with, they're going to affect you. There are two ways of dealing with it. One is you pass import restrictions. Okay, we're just going to stop buying two hundred billion dollars worth of stuff a year. Sounds real good. Congress loves that kind of talk. It's called the Trade Protection Protection Bill. Well. If you don't stop, if you stop buying Hondas and Italian shoes and all that, guess what? They stop buying our stuff because there's the money flow is just like you pinch a hose, a water hose, how the water stops. Trade is the same way. When you start restricting things, it gets restricted through the entire system because the world right now is an interchange of goods and services, totally. It doesn't stop at our border. We're buying cars, they're buying our oil field equipment, we're selling computers and medical equipment that we're bringing in things from Korea, Taiwan, everything you can imagine, three cases of shoes, a billion different things. What a, and the restrictions are accomplished basically by either tariff or restriction. Uh, a few years ago, the Reagan people put a limit on the number of Toyotas that could come into the country. Uh, X million machines. What that did is it raised the price of your new Toyota a thousand dollars a year, just like that. Uh, it also raised the prices of American cars because they didn't have to compete on, compete on prices. So therefore, there was no pressure for them to hold their prices down. Duty is the same thing. You put a 10% duty on a $10,000 car, you have a $1,000 increase in the cost of that car, you pay it. The consumer always pays for these types of restrictions. The problem with restrictions, though, is they don't give us the one thing we really need, exports. If we started exporting a lot more, then we wouldn't need to restrict anything, and we would accomplish several things. A is we would generate income for American industry. The Department of Commerce has statistics and they have found that 90%, 90% of American companies that could export don't. They don't even bother. So this is a, it's not like we get out there and try and fail. We haven't even tried. The same would be as if we had a company and they said, we like Texas a lot, we're only going to sell in Texas and we're going to ignore the other 49 states. You end up with a real small company and whoever is out there in all 50 states is a real big company because you expand your sales base. We're doing that on a global scale. We're only selling in America while the rest of the world is selling globally. And there's 180 plus or minus a few countries in the world. And if we focus only on one, and the Japanese are selling to 180, the Europeans are selling to 180, and here we are with one, you end up with a very constricted market. And that is why the American economy right now is not unlike the Titanic. You almost feel that grinding sound of the iceberg and if it hits us, we're in serious jeopardy. That is why the Japanese have had these multiple billions of dollars to invest in our stock market. 
In fact, right now, they're buying up prime real estate in New York and the rest of the country. Uh, they're buying anything that says value. Europeans are doing the same thing. In fact, in some areas in our economy right now, European and Japanese investors own more than 50% of our company stock and or real estate. Prime real estate in the middle of Los Angeles, New York, Chicago. They're buying a real fine, and they don't buy anything that's a money loser. They buy something that's a real money maker right off the bat. That means that by the turn of the century, 13 years from now, the beginning of the 21st century, most Americans could find themselves working for Japanese and European companies. If we do that, what happens to the American dream? If we do that, what happens to our world power base? Because believe it or not, world power base is not dependent on how many guns we own. It's dependent on how strong your economic base really is. That is what makes the world turn. That is what supports a military budget. If you don't have that economic base, all of a sudden it starts crumbling and everything else falls in on top of it. Right now we have a, an area in the U.S. called the Rust Belt. You know what that is. You know, it's the old industries, everybody thinks it's falling apart. There's no, God, there's no jobs in Texas anymore. Your oil patch has gone pot. Gosh, there's no manufacturing jobs in the Northeast anymore. It's gone to pot. You hear all this, okay? Well, it's not true. It's gone to pot here in the States, yes, because we've saturated our market. We had a global industrial revolution, industrial revolution in this country that started about 100 years ago. We built power plants, we built roads, we built oil fields, we've done all these things. And we've built them up to the point where we're saturated with like cars. The rest of the world, like there are 50, 100 different developing countries out there that don't have any of that stuff. What we have, and we're not out there selling it to them. That is why we have a rust belt. That is why we have a dead oil boom right now. I went to Nigeria last December, my friends. Guess what? Again, I was one of the few Americans running around. There's a bunch of French, German, English people. Their oil wells flow 10,000 barrels a day per well. Go to Texas, we drill an oil well that does 50 barrels a day, five zero, and we think we got a heck of a well. They got a heck, you know, they think it's really kind of dismal if they want it that does 5,000 barrels a day. The company I was talking, you know, I was over there to negotiate a deal for them. They couldn't believe it. I mean, they build an asphalt road right up to their wellhead, and they've got the casing looks like this. They needed American technology. They wanted an American company to come over there and help them put, uh, you know, some of the stuff on the world market. And it was almost impossible to find anybody to go to Nigeria. They all had this idea. There's nothing out there. You know, they're just a bunch of broke people. Africa, you know, starving people. There was in Africa. Because all we see on the news is, you know, some starving little babies, you know, five years ago in Ethiopia, because they did have a famine, it was serious. But that's not the reality. The reality is that there's a tremendous amount of gold, literally and figuratively, in these countries that we haven't even tapped yet. They had gold mines in Nigeria that they don't even bother mining because the oil's so easy flowing out the ground. <laughs> Why go dig gold? They've got emerald mines and things like that. They don't bother with those either. It's too easy, you know. <laughs> well, you know, a 10,000 barrel a day, okay, you guys are all smart. Add a 10,000 barrels a day on one well, okay? Exclude all the other wells they've got around around there. And if oil is $20 a barrel times 10,000, what's that up to? A couple hundred thousand dollars a day? A couple hundred thousand dollars a day and that baby flows 365 days out of the year. And if you own 40% of it as the American investor, I can live on that. I can live on that real well. 
But getting American companies out there have uh, not been so successful convincing them that these are incredible opportunities. Brian has a little handout. He's going to give you a little bit on China. China is a country of a billion people. They are technologically where we were back in about 1900, barely. They don't have roads. They don't have power plants. They have a few. They need a bunch more. They don't have consumer goods, all these little appliances and all that stuff that we've made and made and made and we've stocked on the shelf and these companies are closing down and selling all this stuff. They said, well, there's no consumer market. There's a billion potential sales sitting right out here. What y'all doing here? Go up, man. <laughs> the reason I really want to stress this is that our country is really at a crossroads right now. And it's the choice of our leadership, but even more of that, it's the choice of you. Okay? Because you are the next generation of leadership, business, and political in this country. Right now, your Japanese counterparts are learning English. They're learning American history. Your European counterparts are learning French, German, and English. And they're also learning about us. What do you know about them? It makes a tremendous difference in the world. You cannot operate globally when you don't know. I saw, let me give you a little example. American executive, a $500 million a year division of one of the companies <coughs> lawyer for. And uh, good man, I mean, he's really good in his industry, typical American, he's been, you know, 50 some years old. Went on this whirlwind tour, typical Americans, we always come whirlwind tour, you know. This Tuesday, this must be Belgian, kind of a schedule. <laughs> Even in business, they do that. Got to uh, Saudi Arabia. And we're talking about selling pieces of equipment cost a million dollars a piece, you know, and they really need the business because it's been bad. So, plopped down in the middle of Riyadh and uh, was sipping a bit of coffee with a shade. Just a very standard thing to do. You take your shoes off, sit down, get coffee. And the shake yeah, must have kind of liked it because he said, well, one of my plates for dinner tonight. The guy said, without hesitating, nope, got to be in Kuwait tonight. We got to flood. Guess what? He just walked away from the main dollar deal. Because the schedule was more important than having dinner with that man. And the way business is done in these countries, it's not sitting down and hammering out, we've got the best widget in town and it only costs $1.95 and boom, 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 you know, end of subject. You know, of course you'll buy it. No, it doesn't work that way. If it did, we'd be a lot more successful. It works the other way. In all, in Mexico, China, even Europe, they want to know who you are. Talk about the family. What are your interests? Sip some more tea. Have dinner with a man. Walk out of there and not even talk about your stupid widget. And you got a deal. We don't know that because we've never been trained to think how other people conduct business. We're about the only country in the world that really kind of looks at the object as being the end-all, be-all. We don't care who the sales guy is. We don't care about his family or his business or anything else. We want that car, or we want the supplies, or whatever. And if you're just doing a little, little routine shopping out there, that's the way they are too, but they're talking about buying million dollars worth of equipment. Chinese, for example, they love to sit you down. The first thing you get there, you think, God, these people are really social. I've just been here two hours, and I've already been invited to a banquet tonight. In my office, <coughs> you bet. <laughs> and they'll ring at the table with about 13 people, and there you are. Okay. And everyone gets up and gets a little toast to this mouth tie, which is deadly. Stuff is like drinking jet fuel. And after a couple of those, you kind of feel like this, okay? Yeah, I like you Chinese guys. 
Got any good looking women over here? <laughs> Cancel that deal. They do that intentionally. They like to see what you're like when you get drunk. <laughs> Can you hold your liquor? And if you drink a little much, what do you say? Because they got 13 years there listening and watching. And that's where people, they don't even know they're being tested. They're being tested. And I went to one of those stupid anklets, and it's a patience testing deal. If it's A, can I walk away from the table after the deal? And then B, they don't walk in the next morning and say, well, you passed. We'll do it. I mean, it may be a year or, you know, sometimes two years before you finally grind through the whole process. I mean, it's a big deal when it's finally done, but you think it's never going to happen. And I was in the Pink King Hotel with this uh, Hollywood producer. It's a funny thing. Back in 82, it, it was a lot different than it is today. It's changed so much. But back then, there was, I mean, virtually no wet. The doors had just opened. And I was there negotiating pollution control technology for the power plants. You know, they, they burned soft coal in, in Peking or all through China to cook and to heat their houses. And it's deadly. I got there in February and got to the airport and we flew in this black cloud. I thought, gee, it must be about to snow or something. It was small. And you got a million people in the city lighting up this soft charcoal because they've got no power in their house. And that stuff just fills up the air in the city and becomes this big black cloud. So what they're doing is they invited several companies to come over and say, look, you build a power plant and you can do the turbine and I'm there to talk about pollution control equipment at the end of it. Big electric box, 10 stories tall, that you run all this junk through and you zap it and Cold dust falls out the bottom. It's clean air coming out of the top. We got those here. It's old. It's a hundred-year-old technology. It's originated in England. Well, they don't have it, so they wanted to buy it. <coughs> I was dying from it. And uh, gosh, now I forgot my whole point. <laughs> Terribly embarrassed. Uh, but the reason we were there is to really get down and make a deal with them. And we talked to them for two years. Two years. I mean, we sent technicians through the country, and they looked it over. I mean, they looked it over like they were buying, you know, sterling silver. And we got poured out of there by the Europeans. The um, Jap, no, actually, it was a Swedish company and a German company. What they did, they came in, they pulled a little trick and talked to each other. And they underbid us a novel, uh, like their prices. 25% of our price. Mm. Well, guess what? After, and that wasn't just it, because I got to know the Chinese really well. We were so close to getting a deal. But faith is everything. And American management back here, there was just some new players on the block. And they said, hell no, we're not going to make that kind of deal with them. We don't want to give any, you know, move, room to maneuver or anything. So it kind of fell apart a little bit, and then come back close together. And we could have had it, but for a couple of things. One was they began to think, these guys aren't really serious over here talking to us, the American time. Because uh, we get these blasts and tell us, and I know they would probably, you know, they intercept this stuff, they know what's going on. So that's it. My boss was on our rampage. Uh, and then the Swedes and the Germans said, oh, well, there's our price. After they got the contract, their price ended up being the same as ours. <laughs> yeah, they wrote a real swift contract and put in all these little extras at the end, and it ended up being the same. Chinese still want American technology, but they haven't got it because the old boy that was running the division says, mm -hmm, and he's 65, he didn't care. And that, that division is practically dead in the water because all the American projects dried up. There's very few power plants being built in the U.S. Power plants are needed in Mexico, in China, in Africa, the developing countries, the three big continents, Asia, Africa, and uh, South America. That is where most of our opportunities lie, and that is where we need to be, to really grow and prosper. 
how do these countries learn about Americans if we're not there? Like the old pioneers who went west to Mississippi for opportunities, we have to go further west. We have to go overseas. If we rest on our shores and allow Japan, Europe, and Russia to go into these countries, which they are doing, and providing technical advisors to say, oh, well, we'll, we'll build power plants for you. We'll show you how to do this. We'll show you how to do that. How do they ever know what Americans are really like? How do they understand free enterprise? <coughs> they don't. Just because we sit in front of our TV sets and say, we're great. We've got it, you know, we've got the best system in the world. Does that convince anybody who never sees you in the middle of Africa who's sitting there in a dark village because they've got no power? Do you listen to the Russian come in and give them electricity? Or the American that they never see? happening guys. It's very true. John Kennedy said when we began the moon push, we do this not because it will be easy, but <coughs> because it will be hard. Same for being a global American. It's not easy to go a lot of countries and you know, it's middle of India for example, I get off the airplane, they pop the door at five o'clock in the morning. It's damp and humid and then all the smells of exotic things that you don't think about too much are there. And it's hot. It's really hot. Get in this little taxi cab and I'm not, you know, I'm not real, I'm not a football player, but you can tell. I'm kind of crammed in the back of this little Fiat. And we're racing down the road like this, you know. And there are people walking across this four-lane highway. You drive on the left side like you do in England. It's India, okay? The British were there first. What, what can we say? We're coming in there. And uh, you swear to God, you're going to run through all these people, kill people left and right. And they step left, they step right, and we <laughs> right through the middle of it, 50 miles an hour, go into the hotel. This is getting to the hotel from the airport. And I'm trying to decide, do I want to scrunch down this way, or do I want to kind of scrunch down this way? My suitcase is filling up the trunk, and my briefcase is filling up the other half of the seat. I finally decide, I'm going to scratch this way. If anybody comes to that windshield, I'm going to be on the floor. <laughs> but as a matter of fact, we came away from India. We uh, made several million dollars worth of contracts there. And it's very profitable. In fact, it kind of kept one of our divisions alive because they had no other business anywhere else. This is going to affect you because by the turn of the century, not only are we going to have to be dealing with our older technology things, and you guys are going to be the next business leaders. You guys are going to be our next politicians who are going to say, we are going to make this a policy to be global, to be strong. <coughs> and if you don't, <coughs> look what happened to Britain. Britain once. You know the old saying, the sun never sets on the British Empire? <laughs> Where's Britain today? They almost lost the war to Argentina. The only reason they did was a couple of warheads somebody who sold Argentina didn't explode when they hit their ships. It can happen to us too. Look at the Romans. They were a great empire. They lasted, a, you know, quite a while, but they faded out too. Got overstretched. Our economic base is what either makes us a superpower in the 21st century or makes us a fading life. Right? Just a little history. After World War II, we were the number one power. No question about it because here we were. We did get bombed. Europe got devastated. So did Japan. That we all sort of entered the, the industrial age about the same time. They got wiped out. That continued for a couple decades, but guess what? They built up in Europe their industrial base, and they built up in Japan. Doesn't mean we need to go bomb them again, it just means this is a fact of life and that we're all now about a threesome out there. The difference is they're playing a global game. They have to export, and they've been doing it for a number of years. We have not, we've been isolated. But now it's a difference of do we move forward or fall behind because not only in the old technology, I've been talking about power plants, but we haven't even talked about space. The Europeans will have a space shuttle in operation, in flight, in the 1990s. 
Japan is looking at having their own space shuttle in operation, in flight, in the 1990s. The Russians are going to have theirs in the 1990s. They have already outpaced us on the space program. I just heard on, their, on the news this morning that they are preparing, they have been sending this, they've had people constantly in orbit for like some incredible period of time, months and months and months. You know why? They've been testing to see it takes approximately two years to send a crew to Mars and back. We beat them to the moon, guess what? They're going to determine, they're determined to beat us to Mars. And they're going to do it unless we change. Because the, now the technology race is on. The 21st century is going to be the century of technology. It is now a global world of technology. And those who lead, like the Super Collider Project that Brian mentioned, critically important for us as a country because it keeps you on the edge of who's got the best widget. Because if you don't, you lose. It's a win-lose game these days. And right now, we're on the edge. The microchip, the computer, used to be solely our domain. They make them in Hong Kong. They make darn good. I went over there and bought an Apple-compatible little widget for my computer just to see if it worked back in the early 80s for a, a little modem for communication. It worked great. It was like a fourth of, or a tenth of the cost they were here. $100 here, I think I paid $5 for it because their labor is so low. <laughs> the high technology race now is just kind of open to everybody. And you're now talking about our future is high technology. I mean, we've got only two ways to go. We've got to expand globally to increase our market base to overcome this $200 billion deficit and start selling like mad out there and being out there so they can say, I like those Americans. And most of them, they do like Americans. They just don't ever see many of them. <laughs> and then continue our leadership into the technology of the 21st century. And there's only one way to go. The next frontier is space. There ain't no other frontier out there. And either we lead it or we watch the Russians, the Japanese, and everybody else do what we have done and sink slowly into the British Empire. <laughs> I'm not in favor of that. I think we ought to stay number one. And we're at the edge now where if we don't make those decisions, we will not be number one. And the decisions have to be made today because we're talking about five and ten year deals to get these things rolling. You want to be global? Great. It's going to take you five, ten years to really get out there. They need people like you. They need marketing people. They need linguists. We need people who are interested in going out there and making a good impression because that is what is going to make our country something to be reckoned with on a global scale. We cannot win with guns. We can only win by playing a global game, and it has to be a smart game. We have to educate <coughs> our youth of today to be the global leaders of tomorrow. Do you understand international customs, foreign languages? Do you understand anything? Point to a map. Do you know anything about any of these countries? I'm not being critical. I'm just asking rhetorical questions. They know about us, but that doesn't help us if we know nothing about them. Because the winner is those who know what the interests are in these areas. What do you know about Mexico? Mexico makes all their own cars, I think. Everything for a car built in Mexico is made in Mexico. So they're not as far behind as you'd like to think. The Chinese are launching satellites with their own rockets. The Chinese, who don't even have power plants, have commercial space launching vehicles. And we do not. Ours is sitting on the ground, unfortunately. I mean, there's some movement now, and they're kind of thinking, oh, God, we've got to have you know, some of those. There's no strong commitment from Washington 
that we are going to be phase leadership. Did we hear the president ever talk about really strong terms? It's critical to our future. Our next president hopefully will talk about that. The bottom line and in conclusion, I just want to say we must be global leaders. We all have the potential to be global Americans. John Kennedy said we've got to do it, not because it will be easy, but because it will be hard. We can only truly win with global awareness of what is going on around us and by playing a smart global game. We can compete with the Japanese. I've, I've beat the Japanese out on contracts. They're doing it because they're playing a smart global game. They're not playing a domestic game, they're playing a global one. We have to do the same thing. We can do the same thing. We must show the free enterprise on a global scale. I remember riding in a car in Bolivia back around 1980. They just had the 189th coup that they ever had. They were, <laughs> as we turned a curve in the road, there was a group of about 20 soldiers standing there with these little nasty looking submachine guns. They were staring right at us as we walked by. They did not move. I had a camera in my lap. Guess what? I'll do anything. <laughs> I did not move that camera because they were ready to use those things. Let's not give you an impression of free enterprise at work. But in other times, traveling through Mexico and India and China, you don't see that. You see roads being built, power plants going up. They need hospitals. They need everything. That is what we need to be involved with with global American technology involved. Setting the standard for these countries. Our technology becoming their industrial standard instead of someone else's. So that we become tied with our global neighbors. That will convince them of the true value of American free enterprise. And then we can enter a new age in which no child in this world need die because of unsanitary water. And no child need die because of a lack of medical care and treatment. And a new century in which America leads the world into the space industrial era. When we have done that, my friends, we will have reached Shangri-La. Thank you. Go ahead.